Well, Jane Badler, it is really great to see you again. Thank you. It's so nice to see you, Craig, again. You know, you think about your life, such a Hollywood movie and TV fave, but many of your fans from around the world might not know this, that you, in fact, are now an Aussie. I am an Aussie. I mean, I'm always going to be an American. Because, of course. I mean, I was born in Brooklyn and I grew up in New York, so you can't take that out of the girl. But I've lived here 32 years, so that's a very long time. And this is my home. So, Jane, you came to Australia in the late 80s, it was, for the redo of Mission Impossible with the late, great Peter Graves, of course, uh, reprising his role as uh, Jim Phelps, along with the fabulous Tao Penglis, who I know you are a, a great friend of. And that's essentially, you came and you never went home. Is that the story? I definitely didn't think I was going to be moving here. Mm -hmm. And um, after we finished season one, I moved back to America and, um, you know, things were kind of heating up for me again. You know, the career of an actor can be very up and down. And mm -hmm. I'd had a bit of a down period after V. And so this was really a huge reprisal of my career. And we got picked up for a second season in Melbourne. And the first week I was there, um, Toddy Goldsmith, who is a celebrity here in Australia, invited me to a party. And uh, I met this man. Uh, and he was very cute, uh, but I didn't think, uh, you know, I was going to marry him. But here I am. I obviously did marry him. And 32 years later, I'm still here. His name is Stephen Haynes. Yes, exactly. And my agent was very cross with me. And that's a story in itself that I can tell you, but very cross with me. In what respect? So, you know, he stuck by me for years and uh, and I'd stuck by him and through the V and through everything that happened. And then all of a sudden I was in demand again and I just left. And, uh, and then many years later, when the new V was reprised, uh, the V reimagined, which was about 10 years ago, I was desperate to get the role of Diana. And I called him, I found his number. I hadn't spoken to him in 20 years. And I called him and he said, you're crazy. You know, you can't come back and think that you can do this role and your career's over, you're too old and all this. And he was so still angry with me 20 years later. But there, I did get the role, by the way, and uh, that was called Determination. Yep. Doesn't it go to show that some people can really hang on to a grudge? Oh, my God. He held on to a grudge. Is this true, Jane? You actually started your showbiz life off as a beauty queen, obviously, in the US where you were born. Yes, I did. I was... Uh, I mean, I'd always sung and always, you know, I played the flute and I was in the, I was a good kid, sort of. My parents at least thought I was a good kid. And, um, and when I was 18, my mother, my parents had divorced when I was 13 and she was a single mom of four kids. And she said to me, um, you should join this beauty pageant and uh, kind of pushed me into it. And I won the Miss Manchester and then I won the Miss New Hampshire and then all of a sudden I'm in the Miss America pageant. I was in my last year of high school and I, they gave me an orange Ford Torino that said on it, Miss America. And I used to drive it to school every day and the boys would leave notes under my windshield. Not all nice ones, by the way. <laughs> and when, the graffiti, when they started to graffiti, the, the side of the car, I realized it was time to stop driving my orange Ford Torino to high school. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, what a story. And I think that was 1972, wasn't it? The Miss America. Uh, 73, I won in 72 and then, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so, or maybe it was. I don't even know anymore. What, you know, maybe I don't know. Life can be a blur, Jane, and you're oh. forgiven for allowing it to be so. 1977, now there's a date that I'm sure is very significant for you because apparently that was uh, your TV debut and, of course, in, in one of the most iconic series, uh, One Life to Live. Well, it, that was so interesting because I had just, gra I just graduated from Northwestern University as a theatre major and there was sort of that fork in the road where I could have gone into becoming a theatre actress or done television. And I had done two, two plays on the road yes. and I realised that made I was so homesick. It was a very difficult thing to do on the road. And uh, so I auditioned for this soap opera, One Life to Live. Judith Light was one of the mm -hmm. stars, who we all know who Judith Light is. And um, I was so scared. I'd never been on television. And I'll never forget, I had three lines. I was in a mental institution. That was my character, which was perfect. Because let me tell you, I felt like I was in a mental institution. I had three lines and I literally was standing behind, you know, the set. And no one could talk to me because I went back and forth all day going over my three lines. That's how nervous I was. Are you one of those people that has trouble remembering lines? Or now that you've got the whole thing so down pat, 
and you know how it works, it all comes easy to you? That is the best question, let me tell you, because that is the question everyone goes, how do you learn lines? Not mm -hmm. like, how do you get into your deepest emotion? How do you learn lines? Well, when I was young, I had no problem. That was one of my great skills. Because on a soap opera, you can have 20 pages a day. I mean, they literally shoot an hour each day. You, ha you Overnight, you have to learn the lines. And I would just do during Now, it's a whole different story. <laughs> I literally panic. I, I got cast like last year in this very bad TV show, I shouldn't say that, called Reef Break. It was like an ABC show and I got cast as a cop. And the first day I was on the show, I literally had a monologue to all the other cops it was like a month before every day every single day in my sleep when i ate breakfast every all i did was do the monologue in my head that was the truth that's how i thought can i remember this monologue oh i mean i had an audition a few weeks ago and i had to learn this is what they do to actors let me tell you you have an audition you have to learn five pages of dialogue. Oh, and we want it tomorrow. The test is tomorrow or 10 pages of dialogue. And you go, oh my God. And there's part of you that's saying, I really just do not want to put myself through this, but you know, you will put yourself through it. And for some reason, I just was able to do this particular part, um, like learn it because it was a pretty simple, simple role. <laughs> it was not like complicated, but this is part of being an actor. It's one of the th skills you just have to do. Those three lines in One Life to Live um, kind of saw you do good in that because you wound up with this character that, as I remember, it had an absolute truckload of troubles, didn't she? Oh, yes. Oh, my God. In and out of mental institutions, tor you know, tortured my husband, who was Peter Jansen. I remembered his name, Peter Jansen. And the guy that was played my husband was a Scientologist. Not that I judge that too harshly mm -hmm. but he was a scientologist and every time we would go on he would jump up and down about 10 times and be like so crazy like i used to think this is just a soap opera like please don't torture yourself like this you know it was um it was it was a good it was a good kind of baptism by fire let's put it that way but then uh along comes a really fabulous role for you in falcon crest and of course you got to work with the late great jane wyman i mean was that jane a kind of a master class watching somebody like that work yes and kim novak i worked with her yeah. you know that was a difficult job that was kind of after i'd done v and they offered me the role of the nanny and it was a very it's a very political thing when you walk into a show like falcon crest that was very well established and they're already very big stars so when you walk into that you have to find your niche without stepping on toes so it's quite tricky um and i enjoyed that show but i can say that it was it was a little difficult to navigate jane wyman was an unbelievable professional Yes. Like never, like almost like ice, like never gave anything away. She'd walk on the set, extremely prepared, extremely professional, always very polite, but I never felt like I really got to know her. Whereas Kim Novak was incredibly open. She was a very warm and open person. Very, she loved horses. She had a property up out in the mountains somewhere. She hadn't acted for years. I mean, for you, that must have almost been like a pinch yourself moment because these are people who came up through that that Hollywood studio system and they did it really tough along the way, didn't they? Totally. And they are, you know, working on this incredible series and there are you, um, just, I suppose, radiating in their fabulous glow. I mean, I think the scariest person that I've ever worked with was probably Angela Lansbury. Really? Yes, I was. she wrote? On murder she wrote and we did a i did an episode with her and um and she was like my idol i mean i watched her movies growing up she was also a great broadway star and um to work with her uh was was kind of frightening i mean In what respect because you know you put people on a pedestal you know these great hollywood stars and you never think of yourself as kind of being at that level um, but she was so beautiful. Oh my God. So warm down to earth. I mean, just, you know, someone you'd want to work with really. I'm so glad you said that for a moment. I was panicking because 
I had the great delight, Jane, of interviewing Angela at her home in Brentwood. Oh, my in God. In Los Angeles. And I have to say she was the most kind, amazing woman, answered her own door, did her own hair and makeup, made cups of tea and cookies for the crew, and she could not have been more humble, more yeah. kind, or more incredibly generous. And she told me that because I said, you, you know, the thing about Murder, She Wrote is that it's filled with all of these legends and wonderful stars of yesteryear and so forth. And she said, Craig, that's what I always set out to do because it is a damn hard business. And especially as you get a little older, sometimes those roles are hard to come by. She was in that position to be able to offer people, friends or not, uh, work in a series that was popular all around the world. And i got to say, what an incredible heart. I never forgot that. Yeah, and she really appreciated that she had that series, you know. It was like a gift to her. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Now, of course, the 80s and you become the queen of sci-fi TV, as you say, Diana, supreme commander of what is now an incredible cult classic. And we're talking V. How did that role come along for you? Well, you know, I had this kind of like desire to do nighttime television. In those days, it was a real hierarchy. There was daytime, there was nighttime, and there were movies. That's It's not like that now. and. I was going, they were flying me back and forth first class to all these auditions, like the A team and all these kind of strange programs. And I just, I went, I flew in and Kenny, Kenneth Johnson, who was the creator of the Bionic Woman, Million Dollar Man, The Credible mm. Hulk, he was at the helm of it. He'd already seen hundreds of people for Diana. They'd been a month into filming, they'd had a great tragedy on the set. Dominique Dunn, who's the, oh. the daughter of Dominique Dunn, mm. had been murdered by her, her boyfriend. And there was this whole kind of feeling on the set, which I, I didn't know about. And I walk into this hotel room and it's like he instantly knew that I was the person he was looking for. Mm. And I went back to my hotel and they slipped a note under my door, don't leave town. And the next morning I was in prosthetics. So it was a very quick, and I, at the time I was doing The Doctors with Alec Baldwin in New yeah. York and I was the arid extra dry girl. So I was a very busy girl. I was back and forth, both coasts, and it was quite a heady time, you know? That's right, I forgot you were the arid extra dry girl. See, there's, a, <laughs> the there's arid... a funny little cul-de-sac in your showbiz life. I've had a lot of funny cul-de-sacs, let me tell you. Wow, how fabulous. <laughs> I was reading in Vanity Fair recently, you probably saw it, a, a, a wonderful it. kind of look back yeah. on what is the phenomenon of V and, and all the sorts of things that went on. In the US alone, that series had over 33 million mm. viewers an episode. I mean, those figures are absolutely phenomenal, aren't they, Jane? Yes. And I mean, then there was no internet. I mean, there was no, uh, you know, Instagram and Facebook and all the things now that people use. So I had no idea of the extent of that influence until years later when I kept getting fans contacting me. And even now, like I, I get a lot of crazy, let me tell you, I get a lot of crazy uh, messages, on, mostly men. I mean, once you became established, once that show became so loved in America, then all around the world, what was that level of fame like, that intrusion into your life? Do you know what? I didn't really enjoy it. I mean, I wish that it happened to me now because now I think I can handle that. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it was so full on. It was very stressful. I mean, I was on the Johnny Carson show, the David Letterman show, Phil Donahue. I was on all the top talk shows. Um, I was in the Macy's Day Parade, you know, riding in my own float with Mark Singer. And, um, and it was kind of like overwhelming. It was overwhelming. I felt the pressure of it. And uh, I don't think I really uh, enjoyed it or used it in order to funnel it into greater good. You had millions of fans all over the world and you became this sex symbol. Yeah. In that red outfit. So there's another dimension to it all. And I can only imagine some of the crazies that would come out of the woodwork with regard to that particular dynamic. Yeah, I mean, it's still happening now, which of course now in my six, well into my 60s, I'm very flattered, you know, I mean, but it's a little weird, you know, I mean, it's like to get all these comments all the time, you know, on my Instagrams and my Facebooks. Um, but, you know, this part of me that I'm, you know, I have another project in the works right now, and you have to kind of keep it going. 
do you know it's something that you do have to keep going and i'm grateful for it i really am thinking about your character she had the enormous hair how many cans of hairspray jane do you reckon you went through a day i can tell you to this day if any makeup artist puts a hairspray near me i'll get out of here because <laughs> that's all they did was spray my hair with hairspray and it i hated it right but you know, decades on, many fans have come out. I mean, this must be must be very flattering, um, but saying that you were their first celebrity crush. I mean, how, how does that make you feel? It feels really good, you know. And I and I feel good because a lot of it is in the you know LGBTQ community. That makes me feel really good. Yes, um, that I can be slightly iconic. Um, and I still kind of think, how can I give back to that? You know, what can I do to um, to make a difference for that all that love that I've gotten? Yeah. It's Hang on, Jane. Let's just rephrase that slightly iconic. Let's say massively iconic. Nobody ate a hamster quite like you. <laughs> no, that is true. Mm, that's true. <laughs> how in the heck did they do it? I mean, honestly, when I look at that now, I go, oh, my God. It's like, you know, we know how good it is now special effects but they they were it was painstaking i mean they had to build a dummy out of my face and they had three men behind me they had to build tubing in my neck and they pumping air from behind me into my neck so it looked like it was a snake yeah. and then at the right time they did a quick edit to the dummy whose mouth opened really big which it looks like now let's be honest at the time it was terrifying but now we're so advanced that it does look a little dated and then you know in the re the v reimagined uh morena baccarin played my role yeah. i played her mother and when you see they did that famous scene they reenacted the famous scene and when you see now what they've done it's extraordinary it's really yeah. it's scary now the great robert england of course is freddy krueger from those nightmare on elm street movies but he had a role in v uh, do you remember him and what was he like to work with I I think he was you know we all were grateful we were grateful i don't think he was some anyone that anyone knew and he made a role that could have been quite i use the word jewish nebishy mm -hmm. and he really made something extraordinary out of that role people remember that role um and he went on to do probably have more as much fame as well as anyone do you know he really created an incredible career for himself i didn't have a lot to do with him because I don't think I even had a scene with him because the visitors and the, um, you know, the people fighting the visitors were actually quite separate most of the time. Now, Jane, for years, there's been talk about bringing V to the big screen. Um, have you heard the talk? Is there any truth to that? Is there anything in the works? Well, you know, Kenneth Johnson has been trying to get this movie made for, I mean, probably, I don't know, 20 years, 10 years. I'm not sure how long. And um, I just think that he's run into problems because it's a huge budget. I mean, maybe 60 million, 80 million. And it's very hard to raise that sort of funding. Um, he's 80 years old now. He still sounds like a young man. I had a chat with him last week and he still sounds very young and very vibrant, like you would not know. But I think the industry might think, you know, I mean, you know, if Biden can be president, at 82, well, then Kenny can make V, right? So if they did get the funding happening and yes. and if the green light was given, would you hop back into that outfit? I absolutely would do anything for Ken Johnson because right. I believe in him. I think, you know, his idea is to recreate the whole scenario in modern terms with a very yes. young cast. Yes. But I'm sure that he would want to bring some of us on to do, you know, cameos. And I would... Absolutely love to work with him. I think he's a genius. As we've whirled through the years and the decades, and especially now, there's been like fringe groups and all sorts of conspiracy theory lunatics who are convinced that reptile people are running the world and it was all hidden there in V. I mean, what right. do you make of that? How do you kind of scramble your brain around that? I have trouble with conspiracy theories. You know, that's just something that I tend to um, kind of not get too involved with because you can spend your life uh, going down that torturous road mm. and it's not very good for your mental health. So what do I make of that? I think there's always gonna be people that are gonna find conspiracy theories and everything. And we all know most likely that is not true. 
Now, after V, you starred in a whole lot of television shows, um, like, for instance, Hotel with James Brolin and the wonderful Anne Baxter. Do you have memories of working with those two? Oh my God, I completely don't. I can't remember. that. I Don't ask me why. I What I do remember is it was a very big cast. Yes. I can't remember my impressions of them, like other than that they weren't difficult to me. Do you know what I mean? Like that it was a very nice job. It was an easy job. Walked in. I don't remember feeling too anxious about that job. But isn't it weird that I don't have strong opinions of that one? You know? Yes. Now tell me about Mission Impossible. Peter Graves, of course, was in the original. Uh, mm-hmm. It was redone in the late 80s. Uh, was that a fun series to work on? Because as you say, season one, I think, was shot on the Gold Coast and then season two uh, was in Melbourne. That was the most fun I think I ever had. You know, that was, first of all, I I replaced a re, an, I replaced someone, uh, she, Terry Markwell, who was an Australian. And um, for whatever reasons, I guess they wanted to replace her. So I auditioned for it in LA and then they brought me out, but they hadn't told her she was being replaced. Oh. So I had to sort of like, you know, kind of sol- skulk around and not let her know that I was on the set. Um, and then they killed her off. And I arrived and, um, and I loved Teo immediately. Teo and I, mm. Penglis and I immediately became besties. And, um, and Tony Hamilton, who sadly passed away, was super fun. And I just, I felt very well taken care of as the only girl. I played different characters, different accents every week. And I met Steven. Um, and of course, the first season, we were all a bit out of control. You know, <laughs> have to be honest. Um, you know, we were all kind of like, kids in a playpen that were let out because we were all single and um and i was newly divorced and um and i must say i, I really let myself have fun <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry that i'm laughing but i was a bit of a wild girl and so was everyone else and so we were working hard and also you know there we were in sunny gold coast and uh i was staying at the marina the marine the mirage the sheriff yes. mirage opposite and i just like had a ball what was Peter Graves like? I'm sorry, I'm thinking about what I got up to. So that's I can imagine. Happened. I was going to probe, but then I thought, no, I should find my place. <laughs> right. Peter Graves was the ultimate gentleman. Yes. Like the ultimate. I mean, he would he he was he was behaved. He behaved. <laughs> he would go home after we didn't see a lot of him. I mean, I think he basically worked and then went home. We were a lot younger, so I think you know. But um, I, I didn't get super friendly with him. I just remember him being the ultimate professional and super nice, really nice. Did he kind of tell you fabulous stories from the original 60s yes. series yes. of Mission Impossible just to bring some kind of context to where it was? Yeah, he did actually. And that was really wonderful because that was the iconic. The original series was the one I watched and it was iconic with Barbara Bain yes. and of course, Phil Morris who yes. was in the, um, the later Mission Impossible, his dad, Greg Morris, was in the original one. That's right, he was yeah. too, yes. Yeah. So that was kind of interesting. And so he had a lot of stories as well. Um, and he played, I think he might have played the same role, which was interesting, the one who had all the disguises, the one who made all of the, made all of the disguises. And, of course, who could forget that unforgettable theme song? Oh, yeah, I loved it. And there's an image of me that I love so much that... Where I'm just like, the, the, whatever the one, what is the theme? You know, with the match lighting. Yes, I do. And then I'm coming up out of the water and I'm wearing like a low cut thing, you know, with, and I'm like this. And I just love that. I just loved it with the light matching. You know, it was like, and then the second season was Melbourne and I met my husband. Yes. The first week I was there, the second week I was there. And so there I was sort of doing all of that, you know, getting to know him offset and falling in love and then working on Mission Impossible for six months. Once again, one of the most spectacular experiences. Yeah. Where did you two get married? We got married at his home, Mm -hmm. at his, at his mother and father's home. He lived in a beautiful, incredible Georgian mansion. And, um, you know, I grew up in a fairly, 
uh, middle class, you know, like I said, single mom, four kids. So when he first showed me where he grew up, I must admit, I was a little gobsmacked. <laughs> no, I mean, I was actually overwhelmed, you know, when I walked in, I went, oh, okay, wow, you know. And um, his mom and dad were really down to earth. And I was pregnant. And so one month, within one month, she put together the most beautiful, beautiful wedding, except nobody from my end was there except my mother. And all his ex-girlfriends were there. And I was <laughs> nauseous. And so I couldn't even party that night, which was such a drag. And I remember looking out into the audience, everyone going, like, you know, because I had stolen the prize from who is this girl from LA, you know, this, this kind of divorcee Hollywood actress, you know, so wow. it was kind of like, was it the, I would like to get married again. Let's just put it that way. Can I please, <laughs> can I please get married again? <laughs> Look, Jane, to your life in Australia, and it, it's fascinating. Uh, you're a singer, you work the cabaret clubs, uh, you've recorded albums. Uh, I know for a bit, you had this wonderful one woman show, sort of an homage to Rita Hayworth. It, it just goes to show you really do have so many layers of fabulousness in terms of your talents. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, I'm creative. And I think when someone's creative, they create. And it doesn't have to be just acting or singing. It can be whatever you need to feed your soul into. And, um, and so, yeah, so I've started writing um, in the last two years. I'm writing a memoir. I cannot wait for this because yeah. even just during our chat now, uh, I'm just getting a hint that there is just so much more to Jane Badler, that is for sure. Yeah, no, there's, there's a lot there that a lot of people don't know. And it's just a matter of what you put in it and what you don't put in it. And, uh, and the journey that I've been on, you know, resilience, survival, because that's really the journey we all want to read about. How do, people, how do people overcome a tsunami or how do people overcome whatever they overcome? And that's really the message that I want to give to people is that you really can have a good life no matter what happens to you. Well, and, and thinking about you in that respect, um, you know, to many, it looks like your life has been a magic carpet ride of all of these wonderful opportunities. You, uh, you were a mum to two uh, boys and then sadly, one of your sons left us um, back in um, 2020, it was. So that's three years ago now. But how do you overcome that kind of incredible, crushing, devastating loss? I think at first you have to decide that you're not going to overcome it because you don't, you never overcome it. Mm. It's never anything that goes away. So you learn to make friends with grief and you say, well, here, here you are. This is now part of the fabric of who I am. And this influences everything in my life. And everything's more beautiful. Everything's more scintillating. Um, coffee is more beautiful because you realize how fragile life is. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, there's a very bitter sweetness to it all. And pain is just pain. You just say, well, here you are. And, and I'm okay with this. I'm okay with what I'm feeling. So I think I've just had to kind of make friends with it and not fight it. We're talking about your son, Harry Haynes, only 27 when he left. And I mean, looking at his body of work for somebody so young, he'd been in American Horror Story, Sneaky Pete. He was a wonderful musician. He was a model. Um, he just seemed to have this incredible charisma, you know, that kind of it yes. factor that what's that, that is what makes people so special. So you, you have to wonder what happened. Why was it that he just felt it was his time to no longer be here anymore? He is such a fascinating person. He is like there was no one like him. And which is the other reason I want to write the book, mm -hmm. because from a very young age and it's like, think about, I mean, I'm not underestimating when I say Van Gogh or someone like that. He was absolutely brilliant. There was no one like him. And um, not only that, magnificently beautiful and so talented and so fearless, but he also came with that came a lot of mental health issues. And he had a very serious sleep disorder. Mm. So from a very, very young age, he actually could not sleep. I mean, I can't even imagine what that is like. So around, we tried everything, light box therapy and all sorts of things. And unbeknownst to me at 13, he went on the dark web and he started self-medicating. 
So from a very young age, he was starting to get addicted to prescription pills. And that changes your brain. I mean, that's when your brain is developing. So you never really get a chance to develop a brain in a healthy way. And of course, that led to other drugs and eventually a very, very severe addiction. But through it all, he still, like you said, he still achieved a lot. And um, a lot of my story is about, about that. I mean, what's it like for a mother to have a child with addiction? Um, that is just the most, I can't even tell you what that's like. So I'm gonna take people on that harrowing journey as well, which uh, is very brave of me. But in, in the sense, I do want people to understand what addiction is. But it's also, Jane, a circumstance that so many families yes. encounter and ultimately endure. And sometimes there just seems to be no light at the end of that tunnel. So for somebody like you or anybody who is willing to share their story, you probably have no idea how many other people it helps. I'm sure even in your particular journey with all of this, even just to pick up a little bit of something from somebody else who's been there and gone through it all, you probably found immeasurably helpful. Very helpful. And, and I, when I, Harry was going through his addiction, all, I read so many books on addiction. Mm -hmm. And now I, I, after he passed, I read books on grief. So you, you tend to say, how did they do it? How did they get through it? And I'm fascinated by, you know, even like someone like, you know, Elder, you know Priscilla Presley and mm. her daughter, and they, she lost her son, um, and that really struck me because he was 27, and and uh, sadly she couldn't overcome that because she was quite fragile, obviously, and had addiction herself. But um, it's fascinating to see how how do people deal with this kind of grief, you know? How did Harry's brother cope? That's such a great question, and I think because Harry was took up all the oxygen in the room. He was like huge and bigger than life. That his brother sort of took up the space that was left. And he studied commerce and he did everything right and he was a great kid. But actually, he exploded once Harry with creativity. Once his brother's gone, he's now an extraordinary artist. He's about to release NFTs, which are non-fungible tokens, digital artworks. And he is um has tattoos and he wears Harry's clothes, which is so beautiful. And he's the most creative, extraordinary kid uh, that he said that Harry, Harry spirit has infused in him a sense of fearlessness. And he's been able to actually move forward in a way, in a free way that he couldn't before. I was going to say, do you feel Harry's spirit around you? But then I'm thinking, you do. He's there right now oh, on your shoulder. He is totally. absolutely with you every moment of every minute of every day. And, and he's the one saying to me, Mom, write this memoir, because this is not easy for me. I can tell you, there's a lot of knockbacks in anything that you do. But that is not going to keep me from doing this. That's something that I'm going to I have to do. And I can feel him saying, Mom, you got to do this. You know, what about his dad, Stephen? How did he come to grips with this? I think in some ways men are different and he probably was not able yet to deal with the emotional aspects of it for a couple of years you know whereas i could i dove right into it you know and i think it's still unraveling like three years um with with the loss of someone you love um three years is nothing well time is different time goes very differently it's like a day the the the, the loss is always there like it just happened so I think we're still unraveling the trauma of what happened before he died and the trauma of his passing. So I think that's going to be a long journey for us both. Yeah. Do you get a sign that Harry is there? I mean, sometimes really obvious signs that he's right there with you. Yeah. Well, you know, I went to a lot of mediums and, um, and they, and I know a lot of people probably go, yeah, yeah, like hokey pokey, but honestly, the things they knew that blew my mind so extraordinarily and was very comforting for me to um, to hear people say things that were so powerful to know that he still existed somewhere. Mm. And mostly after yoga, I have a very strong yoga practice. And after yoga, when everything's open, all my chakras and my mm. I lie there um, and uh, and he usually comes to me and I I don't know whether it's me or him, but I hear him speaking and we have conversations and um, he tells me what it's like, where he is, and it's beautiful. And I'm not sure whether I impart my own voice 
or whatever, but it's my time. It's my time after yoga when I'm lying in the dark. And because he's there with you so much, he wants you just to get on with your life, no doubt about that, and just keep doing fabulous things, which you do. Um, you've just finished a movie with Zac Efron and John Cena, haven't you? Yes. With William H. Macy. Can you tell us anything about that? God, it was so much fun. I feel like what a gift. Um, because after doing all these horror films, and especially the last role I played, which was so dark, oh my God, it's not, it's probably going to come out this year called Trim Season. Yes. I played a witch who did horrible things to people. And <laughs> I honestly just thought, please, no more. And then this comedy came along, and I was to play William Macy's wife, who yes. is the most extraordinary actor. Um, to be on the set with Zac Efron and John Cena and Peter Farrelly, the director who's done all the Dumb and Dumber films. Oh, yes, wonderful. And to watch him work, oh, my God, to watch the way he approached comedy um, was so interesting because Heather Mitchell, we had a lot of very wonderful Australian actors in it as well. Yes. Um, and William Macy was great because I, I didn't have, like, a super amount of lines, but I was by his side a lot, and I wanted to really milk those lines, you know? <laughs> And like, I really, every line had 10 meanings. And I was thinking, oh, that I, he bothered me and I'd roll my eyes. And then the director came over and he goes, no, no, you know, you love him, just say the line. And really early on, William Macy kept taking my hand and putting his arm around me. And that set the tone. I thought we're in love. We're actually a couple that loves each other. I don't have to put all this other shit in it, you know, sorry, <laughs> you know. But I think that um, in the end, it was just such a wonderful experience for me. I'm so grateful to have had it. And it's, they're going to have a big premiere and they want me to come. And hopefully it'll be in all the movies. It's a big comedy. It's very funny. Ricky Stanicki, that's the name of the movie, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is so funny. Oh, my God. And actually, I'm not just saying this. I am very funny. I love comedy. I mean, I swear to God, people should say, Jane, come and do comedy because that's my thing now. I know it is, you know, trust me. I was very anxious on this set. Do you know what I mean? This was, I'd never done a movie that was a $60 million movie. I just never have. I've done a lot of things, but I've never done one of those huge Hollywood films. So this was like a gift to be on the set and just observe, you know, everything that was going on. I wonder, do you sometimes get, uh, there is your fur baby. Hello, everyone. I'm just about to get my dog out of here. Okay. Oh, no. Yeah. No, 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 no. Fur babies are allowed to stay, Jane. Oh, look at you. So cute, isn't she? Oh, my gosh. Isn't she just divine? I know. She's a cavoodle, you know. Oh. How old is she, Jane? She's be four. Oh. But, she's, but she's, you know, looks like a puppy. Yeah, she does, doesn't she? Yeah, but oh. she, she's naughty. So, you know, I've just, and I'm obsessed with her, of course. Like, <laughs> <you know. laughs> I say, Jane Badler, it has been an absolute joy chatting with you again. You're one of those truly remarkable, amazing people that just has this way of getting into people's hearts. You really oh, do. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this. I really have. Thank you.